I'll get to that. <laughs> Let's bow for a prayer. Have thy way, Lord, have thy way. You are the potter, we all on the clay. Make us into a new creation this day. Amen. So about a month before we found out that we were having our third child, Tyler, at the end of September, Aaron and I were sitting on the couch one evening flipping channels when we discovered this movie on HBO. And I had heard that there was a movie that was, up the, uh, that was the unheralded sequel to the 2007 hit movie, Knocked Up, but never heard the title nor knew of its release. But with some familiar characters and a little research on our phones as we sat there on the couch, we discovered the movie that we were watching was indeed that movie, and the movie is titled, This Is 40. The movie begins and ends with the main character's 40th birthdays, and in between tells the story of realizing what it means to grow old and the realizations of what happens in the aging process. Some of you are chuckling already. Now, of course, this movie hits home to many of us on many levels. And for us personally, Aaron and I, for the next year, for the next, next year, Aaron and I will both be turning 40. Some of you might be thinking, no big deal. And I know Doug's probably thinking big deal since he turned 40 like 40 years ago. <laughs> But to us, it's a big deal. When I was in Walnut Grove serving as a pastor at age 22, I remember telling my buddies at the farm supply in one morning that I thought 30 was old and 40 was ancient. Needless to say that when I turned 30, all of them had to call and remind me that I said that. And I remember that when I was 11 and my parents turned 40, and I remember being 11 and sitting with my mother at my Aunt Jo's house and hearing about how depressed she was that this was happening. Oh, did I mention that I was 11 when my parents were turning 40? See, I was the youngest of four. And even though my oldest sibling was 10 years older than I was, I was still 11 when my parents turned 40 because my youngest will be two when we turn 40. Oh, by the way, Aaron, you'll be, Tyler will be one and a half when you turn 40. I have no faith that I know. Well, most of you know the story of our realizing that we were having another baby. In summary, we had a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old. We were planning another new stage in our lives and Aaron told me after Aaron told me I spent three days in bed trying to make sense of it all and seriously depressed so yeah this movie kind of hit home to us especially when one of the first scenes that we saw that night was that scene and after finding out from the doctor that she was pregnant the scene that was just played she decides to find out how her husband would feel about it so I'm going to show you that clip now from the same movie Oh, pause that mic, would you? Greg didn't know we had more uh, video here. Go ahead, Mike. Do you ever wish we had a bigger family? No, never for a second. <laughs> never. 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 I love what we have. One, breeze. Two, Brutal. Three, put a bullet in my head. <laughs> and I think about that gray-haired pregnant lady from school and I just feel bad for her. And I feel bad for the kid. Can you imagine all the other little kids? Where's your mommy? Oh, she's the one sitting in that scooter eating a soft cracker. Can't stop that. You know what? It would also be nice for us to spend some time apart, kind of rediscover who we are individually. It would be so great to not see you for like a chunk of time so that I could really just miss you. Remember when we used to miss each other? <laughs> so you can imagine, a month before Tyler was born, the third child of an aging parent, an older brother, who will start college before Tyler goes to kindergarten. Yeah. I already had gray hair, by the way. I'm here to tell you that growing old is tough stuff and not a concept 
that I have embraced very well. We are in a theme here in Fusion asking, are you satisfied? Working through the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to ask this question about satisfaction at some of those core functions of part of our lives and perhaps unlock some keys of how to live a satisfied life. But last week we began with friendship. Today it has to do with growing old. One theologian calls the book of Ecclesiastes a bare-fisted intellectual street fight in determining if there's anything in life worth really living for. The writer takes his gloves off and poses some pretty tough questions. Will stacks of money really satisfy the ache of, in the human heart? Will popularity or, or fame fill the void inside the human soul? Will pleasure or thrill-seeking quiet the restlessness so many of us feel? Will the acquisition of knowledge or power lead to true inner peace? And the writer seems to ask throughout, what is it, what is it, what is it in the end that will finally satisfy the human heart? And last week on this matter of friendship, we concluded that the peace in our relationships come from knowing who has our back in the most direst of times. But this week, in struggling with growing old and, and looking at where we are in life and the way things unfold and leaving us not always in a place we want to be. One of the repeated themed themes in Ecclesiastes is this notion that growing old is not so pleasant. Which makes sense when you consider that the idea behind the book is that the older members of the tribe are sharing wisdom and knowledge with the young based upon their experiences. And I don't mean the 20-somethings teaching adolescents, but the very oldest members of the tribe sharing with the very youngest members of the tribe what will happen as life unfolds? And you're going to find throughout Ecclesiastes this common theme. Dear children, growing old really stinks. Ecclesiastes 11, it reads, The sun, moon, and stars grow dim. What's he referring to? Your vision. You lose your eyesight in old age. Later it reads, The keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men stoop. What does that mean? Is referring to the fact that in our youth, we are strong and steady, but now in our older age, we have tremors and shakes. You know old people, they shake and they shrink. Did you know that? I, I used to be six foot six. That's what happens over time, you shrink. How about one more verse describing how bad it is to get old? This is in Ecclesiastes 8. When people fear heights and danger in the streets, when almond trees blossom and grasshoppers drag themselves along the ground and desire is no longer stirred. Did you understand all that? Let me translate this for you from the Hebrew. Let's call this the shoemaker paraphrase. Listen closely. You know you're old when climbing three, three stairs leaves you breathless and dizzy. When a bump in the night keeps you awake the rest of the night. When you're old enough... When you're old, you're old when your hair turns white, when daily duties make you sore, and when sex becomes a chore. That's right there from the Hebrew, phrase by phrase. Some of you old people know what I'm talking about. You're afraid to laugh. I'm 38 years old right now, so I have time, right? Let's turn, hey, I started working out this week, so I... I started working out this week. So anyway, Ecclesiastes 3, a verse many of you have heard before. If not in church, then perhaps on the radio. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, a time to gather them. Time to embrace, the time to refrain, the time to search, the time to give up, the time to keep, and the time to throw away, the time to tear, the time to mend, the time to be silent, and the time to speak, the time to love, and the time to hate, the time for war, and the time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. God has made everything beautiful in its time. God has set also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The word of God is the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a time for everything, a season for every purpose under heaven. Turn, turn, turn. 
And what does that mean besides some song that came out before I was even born? I mean, there is purpose in everything which includes us. Our lives are not without meaning, and even we, as we express our understanding of God or our belief of where God is leading us, we cannot begin to touch God's vastness. We try to explain and understand, and that's okay. And as we talked before, our religion is our way of answering the questions of life. And perhaps the writer of Ecclesiastes says, when you're looking at life, when you're looking at your life, if you observe closely, you'll find out that life is not a uni, unidimensional, steady state trudge from the cradle to the grave. It is not totally linear. It's not predictable. We know that. And we all learn it's not controllable. Perhaps a more accurate way of looking at life, instead of seeing it as a string of days, is to look at it in terms of seasons as you enter into it. Spend some time in, and then you exit that season, and you move along to the next season. I'm learning that when you get older, that when you talk to other people, people don't want to talk about what age they are, right? But we talk about seasons. And for example, just a little over a year ago, I would, I would, when I met someone who had kids under the age of three or a newborn, I, know, I knew exactly what season they were in, right? And I was thankful that I was no longer in that season of life. Well, again, life is not linear tends to be uncontrollable and unpredictable more of a circle of life. Particularly, but typically when we speak with others, talk with others, we get a sense of what life, season of life they're in. When we talk about our college years, we know what season that is. That was a season. We talk about being honeymooners. That's a very short season. We talk about empty nesters. But what happens if someone says to you, well, my dad is in hospice. Just that one word, and you know what season that family is in. But though growing old is hard and gets hit on repeatedly in Ecclesiastes, it is here in chapter 3. This familiar, familiar verse in the writer here in Ecclesiastes is making a powerful point that the most accurate way to gauge somebody's life or age, or your own age for that matter, is to discern what season you are in, because that's the subplot of the narrative of your whole life. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says there's a time to mourn, a season to mourn, and then there's a season and a time to dance. If you know anyone in a season of mourning, I mean, I do hear faith. As a family, I know just lost their father. Another just lost their home after a crisis within the family. Or looking globally uh, of students grieving over shootings in their school. They are entering a season of mourning, mourning that could last a long time. In a church this size, every single weekend, there's a subset of you who walk through these doors with a burdened or a broken heart. It's the season that you are in. You get up and you question, with my grief, can I really be in public? Can I go to a place where there are a lot of people and will my, will my anxiety be too much? Will it help my season of mourning? Will it hurt? And then you play the odds. For those of you who are here today with a burden or a broken heart and you're in a season of mourning, I'm, I'm glad you're here because sometimes when you come into a gathering and when you're in a season of mourning, God injects a little hope into your equation. Or God might just give you a little perspective or encouragement for a season of, in the season of mourning. Maybe in due time, you'll move out of that season. But the writer in the same verse that the other people that other people are in the season of dancing. There's a season of mourning, but there's a season of dancing. The long-awaited baby was finally born. The adoption went through. The door to employment just swung open. Grad school acceptance letter just came in the mail. It's spring, and the Cubs are not in last place. Oh, I can see it. <laughs> By faith, we can see it. It'll be a season of dancing. Yes. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 7 says... There's a time to be silent and time to speak. With all the noise in our culture, you know what happens to the noise level in our heads eventually. The ambient noise level in our heads goes up and up and up, and it's very hard to hear the quiet whisper of God, to hear that whisper of encouragement, that whisper of direction, that whisper of guidance. In the social media, that we can be very busy speaking with our fingers through texting or tweeting or Facebooking, and in the midst of running everywhere and doing everything for others, for our careers and for our children, the noise just builds. 
But then there's a time when you've got to learn to be silent. I know many of you well. I know the pace of life that some of you are in. It is nonstop from 5 in the morning to 11 at night. And you've got a lot on your plate. But when is your time for silence? When do you really let God have your full attention? When does your family get your full attention? So there's a time to be silent. And in the same breath, the same verse, the writer says, there's also a time to speak. There are times when you'd like to be silent, but then maybe God says, this is a time I need you to speak up. You have a friend who's about ready to make a self-destructive choice. It's not a time for silence. That doesn't mean giving a voice of judgment, but giving a voice of hope and companionship. Right now is my time, my season of speaking. I'm speaking to you right now. It could be a short season. Then again, it could be a long season. We'll see how the next couple hours go. Because there are a lot of suggestions of seasons, but we all have to recognize is that they are just that. They are seasons. And even though like this winter seems to never end, it will, and another season will begin. See, that was perhaps what was the most difficult with Tyler, and that I was ready for one season of life to end. For my two older boys, I wanted to see them off into college and then start their own families, and Aaron and I could work on life for us and our marriage and our relationship. But then that season's going to start over, and here we are as parents of a newborn again. Of a newborn again. And I'll be in the walker when he graduates from high school because growing <laughs> old is difficult. But who are we to kid ourselves? Who's really in control? And those of you with adult children, though one season of parenting has ended and you were ready to start dancing, there's a whole new season that unfolds where you are still parenting and the headaches and the concerns may be even bigger right now because you worry about their paths and their happiness. But here's where this verse finds its hope for us. These seasons will end and another will begin but while we're in the midst of these seasons, what are we learning? I believe that there's this gross misunderstanding from this text of Ecclesiastes. If we read this and say, well, God did this. God puts us in this season to challenge us. See, that theology isn't really consistent with who we claim God to be. Perhaps the key to our satisfaction is found in embracing where we are in life learning about who we are and discovering where God is in the midst of the season. Who said that again? Perhaps the key to our satisfaction and where we are is found in the embracing where we are, learning about who we are, and discovering where God is in this season. And perhaps this is 40, right? I'm approaching 40. Perhaps this is where life is when it's 30 or when it's 20 or when we're 50 or when we're 60. I mean, this is what it is. Are we in that moment? Embracing that. And what we have to offer in that age. And where God is in the midst of that age. Because where we find God when we're 10 is a lot different than where we find God when we're 40. Most of you can name what season of life you're in right now based upon how life is rolling for you. But what we've come to know is this in Ecclesiastes that God has made everything suitable for its time. Verse 11, God has made everything suitable for its time. What that means is not necessarily that God put us here and made us to withstand, but that God has made us suitable because God is with us in this time in life and in that time of life, and in that time of life. And with God, we can embrace any challenge, and joy, any mourning, any dancing, any silence, any speaking. Through these times, though these times are there, they're sometimes painful, sometimes disillusioning, sometimes emotional, sometimes easy, many times hard. Are you learning something about you and discovering God in the midst? And when we do that, perhaps we can begin to embrace who and where we are. So this is about finding meaning and purpose in our lives. It's about finding sustainable satisfaction instead of your life just spinning out of control and you living like everyone else who doesn't have a clue what the plot is. Because see, your story has an ending. But 
where that plot is leading. So it's not so much what age you are. Don't pay attention so, so much to your age. That will take care of itself. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. If you need to figure out how old you are, check your driver's license, look at the picture, and you'll never do that again. But in the midst of your season, as a spouse, as a parent, as a child, as an employee, as a leader, grab the hand of your spouse or your significant other and say, I am with you through this to the end. When the next season begins, I'll be with you there too. Grab the hand of your children, clutch your children tight, and say, I'm going to be the best parent you can ask for each and every day. I will support you and empower you. I will be with you until you decide that season has changed. It's because that's how God embraces us where we are. Through all that internal turmoil that I wasted time with last January and February about being a new parent, it was a waste of energy. Because God was doing something to prepare me for this new season of life. Adjusting when life throws your curveball. Because this might be 40. Who knows what life's going to be like when I'm 50. Be in the moment. Be in the season. In Jesus' name.